Welcome back, fellow mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, we are going to further discuss lactate dehydrogenase, and in particular, we're going to be looking at it as a potential therapeutic target to enhance ketogenic metabolic therapy. So without further ado, let's get into it. So as we talked about at the end of the last video, we're going to look at LDH inhibitors, and we're going to look at its mechanism of what happens when we actually inhibit it. And then we're gonna look at a combination of drug and natural inhibitors for this particular enzyme. So LDH as a therapeutic target. As previously discussed, LDHA is associated with tumor initiation, maintenance, progression, and poor prognosis in many tumors. High serum LDH concentrations are associated with radio resistance in both primary and metastatic brain cancers, tumors. Moreover, multiple studies on various cell lines have shown that attenuation of LDHA increases apoptosis, or programmed cell death, and reduces migration and invasion ability, demonstrating its use as a potential therapeutic target. Mouse model studies have found that LDH LDHA deletion is embryonically lethal. However, when LDHA is switched off in this other mouse model treated with tamoxifen, mice develop severe non-lethal hemolytic anemia, or where the red blood cells actually break down. Furthermore, human genetic defects in the LDHA gene are also non-lethal, but do cause glycogen storage disease type 11. Together, these studies suggest that LDHA inhibition could be a well-tolerated therapy that will impede tumor growth and metastases. So what we have here is an associated graphic, and this graphic is going to be the basis on which this video is going to be making the case of how this works. So this is a little bit different way of looking at it, but glucose is being converted into pyruvate. This is the end product of glycolysis. And normally we have two routes that it can go. It can either go towards the mitochondria and the TCA cycle and ultimately the electron transport chain. But we know because of cancer's metabolic reprogramming that this does not happen near to the degree that it would under normal circumstances with normal mitochondria. And so what happens is pyruvate generally will get converted to lactate and then lactate will be transported outside the cell to create the lactic acid tumor microenvironment. And in between here, between pyruvate and lactate, we have LDHA or lactate dehydrogenase A. And this is the enzyme that we're looking at trying to potentially inhibit as a way to enhance ketogenic metabolic therapy. And what we see here is that potentially when LDHA LDHA is inhibited, then pyruvate cannot get to lactate. It's not being able to be transformed into lactate through that enzymatic reaction. And so what happens is some of that pyruvate is still going to get into the TCA cycle and it's going to be basically putting energy or gasoline through a broken mitochondria and a broken electron transport chain. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna generate reactive oxygen species. You're gonna lose mitochondrial membrane potential and it's going to lead to apoptosis. Now, some of you may be asking, why would we want to put energy through a mitochondria? Isn't a mitochondria a much more efficient way of making energy? Wouldn't this potentially be bad for us? Would this not make the cancer grow out of control? The, the short answer is no, it's not going to. And the reason is because cancer mitochondria are not the same as normal mitochondria. This mechanism, in fact, is basically what is ultimately used by multiple other therapies that we have talked about in the past. So dichloroacetate or DCA is the prototypic pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase inhibitor. It's a different enzyme that it inhibits, but it functionally does the same thing. It allows pyruvate to get into the mitochondria and through the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, and then ultimately into the electron transport chain. And because this electron transport chain is damaged and the mitochondria are damaged, it's going to hypercreate reactive oxygen species, which is ultimately going to lead to apoptosis or programmed cell death. Again, we've seen this in how ivermectin likely works. Ivermectin, at least one of the mechanisms of how it works, is that it increases mitochondrial reactive oxygen species and leads to apoptosis through this caspase system. We've talked about it when we looked at methylene blue and it being irradiated by red light and participating in something called photodynamic therapy. That is going to also lead to reactive oxygen species and ultimately apoptosis and cell death via a very similar mechanism. We're putting gasoline and oxygen through a broken engine and we have more black smoke in the form of reactive oxygen species and that black smoke ultimately leads to cell death. If you were to just look at photodynamic therapy as a whole, when we hit these cancer cells with light in the right intensity and duration, we will create reactive oxygen species species, which leads to cancer cell apoptosis and DNA fragmentation. So this is not a new mechanism in terms of the end state, which is basically that when we put more energy through a broken engine, we create more reactive oxygen species. And that leads to the ejection of cytochrome C and the initiation of apoptosis.
apoptosis. So why is that the case? Well, we know that the number, structure, and function of mitochondria are altered in all observable cancers. So this is a graphic of mitochondria from cancers from Dr. Seafried's more recent paper. And alongside this graphic, we have a whole host of cancers that have observed mitochondrial defects. And that pretty much includes every single cancer that any one of you may have, God forbid, have. And so what we know is that when mitochondria are healthy and the mitochondrial cristae and the structure are intact, the function is intact. And therefore the majority of our energy under normal circumstances are going to be created via the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation system and the electron transport chain. However, as we get mitochondrial damage over time and we lose those nice mitochondrial cristae, you can see that the efficiency of oxphos will go down over time. And in the case of cancer, what happens is, is that substrate low phosphorylation will take its place as a way to make up for the differences and the losses of the OXFOS system. This is the basis of the mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer. But what I'm trying to show you here is that in this graphic, the healthy mitochondria, we have nice looking cristae here. And then you can see how they become less nice looking and ultimately it becomes more, more vacuolated looking. And you see here, it says increase substrate level phosphorylation, decrease OXFOS, increase substrate level phosphorylation, insufficient OXFOS, right? We see that when the mitochondrial cristae are not present. Well, what we now know is that these mitochondrial electron transport chain proteins form these aggregations or these what they call super complexes or respirosome complexes. They are very efficient at making energy in the form of ATP, and they do not have a lot of exhaust in the form of reactive oxygen species, although there will always be some. That is the normal physiologic state. But when they're disassembled, when these proteins are not aggregated into these super complexes, they are less efficient at electron transport. And so therefore, there is less less energy that's being made, and there's more electrons that are being lost in the form of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species, which is a form of oxidative stress. And then this becomes a vicious cycle because when we lose the integrity of the super complexes and there's reactive oxygen species that are created, that then damages the membranes, that then damages proteins along here, and it also damages mitochondrial DNA, which then leads to the misassembly of the mitochondrial super complex and it leads to a vicious cycle. And what do we know about mitochondria and the mitochondria? mitochondrial super complex. Well, we know that mitochondrial cristae shape determines mitochondrial respiratory super complex formation, assembly, and respiratory efficiency. So if we have nice looking cristae, then we're going to have these mitochondrial super complexes that are tightly formed, and they're going to be very efficient at making energy. They're not going to be leaking a lot of reactive oxygen, reactive nitrogen species in the form of oxidative stress. And it's not going to damage the proteins here. It's not going to damage the lipids. It's not going to damage the mitochondrial DNA, which is located right here in the mitochondrial matrix. And it's not going to have a cascade of a vicious cycle. However, when we do have these proteins separated because the mitochondrial cristae are not tightly woven or not tightly packed, then we're going to leak electrons and that's ultimately going to damage mitochondrial DNA, cytochrome C. And these two, when these are ejected from the mitochondria, will set off both the inflammatory cascade through the inflammasome and apoptosis through the caspase system. So again, we have the loss of super complex organization when we have reactive oxygen species, when we have cristae that are disturbed. And then we have an inefficient electron transport chain, which decreases is the amount of energy made through oxphos. And then because of we have destabilization, that leads to more reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress, which further damages membranes and mitochondrial DNA and proteins, which leads to further loss of super complex formation. And we have another vicious cycle. And so what Seafried is saying here without actually saying is that we have nice cristae, we have less nice cristae, we have less cristae, and then we have ultimately evacuated mitochondria, what he calls ghost mitochondria. And that corresponds with this bioenergetic decline that we see here from oxphos. But what is different about cancer in particular is that maybe some other cells along the way here would have been killed off via apoptosis, but cancer cells are the ones that are able to survive. And they're able to survive by upregulating this substrate level phosphorylation, which is what we're trying to take advantage of with ketogenic metabolic therapy, right? We're trying to take advantage of this substrate level phosphorylation, this Warburg metabolism, this upregulation of glutamine metabolism. And so because we see this vacuolated mitochondria here, and we see graphics like this of damaged, deformed mitochondria, and structure and biology equals function. So therefore we know these are dysfunctional as well. We know that if we were to use a lactate dehydrogenase inhibitor or dichloracetate or ivermectin or methylene blue or photodynamic therapy by itself, we know that these mechanisms of putting more energy through these broken mitochondria will lead to the same ultimate outcome, which is basically ejection of cytochrome C, reactive oxygen species and apoptosis or programmed cell death. We basically through lactate dehydrogenase A inhibitors, we will help restore 
the lack or the, the inability for these cancer cells to functionally die through the normal pathways. These pathways are effectively turned off when mitochondrial biology is taken out of the picture through a variety of mechanisms. And what we're doing is we're restoring control over cell death in a particular cell. And that hopefully will lead to the demise of this particular cancer cell and hopefully the tumor as a whole. So what we're, is we're left with inhibitors of LDHA seen in table three. And this is table three here. And in the next video, we're going to be talking about a couple of, of the key drug lactate dehydrogenase inhibitors and some drug lactate dehydrogenase inhibitors that are not on this list, that are not well known, but that we have talked about before in the past. If you like videos like this, please like, share and subscribe. Until next time.